Hi, and welcome back. And now we get to learn about the TV revolution or over the top or CTV or whatever you might want to call it. Uh, and to talk about that, we've got Josh Gooden, who is the head of product marketing for a company that you all will get to know quite a bit over the next several years. It's called Synchro Digital. And some of you all may know some of the history about it. I'll invite Josh to tell a little bit more about it. And so Josh, uh, if you would, go ahead and start sharing your screen, and then I'll let you uh, talk a lot about what you know. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you, David. Here, let me get my screen shared, and then I'll tell you who I am and why I should be talking to you. How about that? All right, guys. Um, as David said, my name is Josh Gooden, and I do work for Synchro, and I've been here at Synchro for the better part of seven years. Um, many of you, uh, as David referred to, may know us. Uh, you may have known us by a different name. Previously, we were called Cobalt, and then we became a part of the CDK Global family, and now we are our own company as Synchro. So we've brought all the great stuff with us and left a lot of the baggage behind, thankfully. Um, I do want to spend a little while talking to you today, but the reason I want to talk to you is because I'm passionate about this space. I really love where OTT is headed. I love where the digital TV revolution is headed. It's been a passion point of mine for a number of years. I have been speaking about it and thinking about it for a long time, and I finally think that this is the year of video, finally. It feels like it's taken a while to get here, but I think we're ready. Okay, so without further ado, let's get started. So the question I wanna to pose to the audience is, is TV dead? Or maybe the better question is, have you heard that TV's dead? And obviously the answer is no, but we are seeing a pretty drastic revolution in the way people are watching television today. You see the stat at the bottom of the slide here that says 35% of people can't be reached anymore in the way they have been for so long. For 70 plus years, we've been watching television over the airways. For the last 30 years, we've had the opportunity to have cable at our fingertips and really change the types of programming that we watch. But if you look at the last five years in particular, you've started to see audiences migrate away from watching television in that typical format. And 35% represents the number of people nationally who have cut the cord. There's a lot of different stats out there, but they tend to range somewhere between the upper 20s and the middle 30s as far as how many people have cut the cord. And so if you're running linear programming today, you are only reaching probably two thirds of your audience. So before I go any further, I feel like I probably should start with what is OTT, uh, digital TV, OTT, CTV. I'll talk about a lot of these acronyms in just a minute, but a little bit of a history lesson. OTT started when we started getting boxes like the Roku and the Fire Stick. And it's called OTT because those boxes literally sat on top of a cable or satellite box. So the media was coming in over the top of the cable service. So we got OTT because over the top is our acronym. And so it's stuck. And that's what people call it these days. So OTT, digital TV, they're the same thing. I tend to call it digital TV because there's so many acronyms that it gets confusing. But they really all mean the same thing. So going back to this idea of having a third of people who have cut the cord, I've got some stats here for you that I think are really telling. If you think about the people who have cut the cord, there's a second set of people that are called cord stackers, and that represents close to another third of the audience who have both linear services and streaming services like OTT and connected televisions. So now all of a sudden we've moved into an environment where two thirds of people can be reached via linear and two thirds of people to three quarters of people can be reached through the streaming environment, the OTT environment. So that's a pretty big shift. Um, if I were really bold, I'd say half of your opportunity to reach people is in OTT. I don't know if we're quite there yet, but we're getting very, very close. The stat at the bottom of the slide is, is really telling. Um, there was a survey done fairly recently of people and they were asked if you could watch live sports in the OTT environment, would you go ahead and cut the cord? And 82% of them said yes. Now, I'm not going to put all of my faith in polls. I think we've all seen lately that maybe that's not the best plan. But I think what it does show is directionally that people are thinking sports is the reason they're hanging on to live television. The reality is, is people and more and more people move over to the OTT space and realize that you can watch live sports there 
and they tell their friends, we're going to see this migration accelerate. Services like DirecTV Now, Sling, and YouTube TV all offer the ability to watch live sports. And so we're going to continue to see people migrate, particularly as the knowledge base grows. And then the last stat, 21,000 people per day. Before COVID, in Q1 of this year, there were about 9,000 people a day cutting the cord and moving over to the OTT environment completely. Since COVID began, we've moved that number from 9,000 people a day to 21,000 people a day. COVID and the change in the environment has drastically accelerated the process of people migrating to the OTT space. So one of the things that always comes up with OTT is, well, that's the young people, right? It's all, all those cord cutter people. They're just the young generation, the millennials. I, th I thought this set of stats was really telling to say, no, in fact, the largest group of people who have cut the cord are, in fact, 35 to 44-year-olds. That 18 to 34 all the way doesn't make up as much of the, of the group as 35 to 44. And more than two-thirds of the people who have cut the cord are 35 or older. So that's a pretty non-expected set of stats, really, when you think about it. Um, and so there's a real opportunity to reach not just millennials, but really across the spectrum of age groups, Gen X and baby boomers even. Both my mother and my mother-in-law are cord cutters, as an example. So I've thrown a bunch of acronyms at you already. Let me very quickly go over some of the ones that I'll use today. OTT, we covered already over the top. CTV or smart TV, it really is just a television that's connected to the Internet. FEP is another one that's common. It's called full episode programming. That'll become important as we start talking about long form versus short. Linear television. This is just the way we've been watching TV for 70 years. It's over the airways. Addressable TV is television that we actually can run ads against. There's a lot of non-addressable TV, and we'll talk about that. Digital television, as I've said, really is long form content that's streamed over the Internet. Video on demand, you are probably familiar with this with your cable or satellite box. You can watch programming uh, that you didn't record, but that is still available to you in a streaming environment. Online video. Counterpoint to digital TV is short form video streamed over the internet. We'll talk about the difference in those two in detail. And then finally, UGC, user generated content. This is just content being produced by everyday people. Think of YouTube or Vimeo or the like. So the next question I get, though, when we're talking about OTT is, but isn't all that stuff Netflix? You can't really run ads against that anyway, that non-addressable question that I was just referring to. And when you look at the space, it's absolutely true. Netflix and Prime Video and others make up large portions of the consumed media in this space. But as you look at linear television, you have to apply the same lens to it as well. Programming that comes through your subscription services like HBO and Stars and Cinemax, you can't run ads against. And we all know the best content lately is coming out of those guys, not out of your standard ad-supported video. Then you've got the advent of TiVo and DVRs that allow people to record programming and then skip ads. If you're recording the football game, as I tend to do, you're going to skip those ads because you're gonna start the game an hour late so that you can skip all the ads and just get to the end of the game at the end of the game. And really speaking of sports, now sports obviously you can serve ads against and it is your best opportunity with live television to serve ads, but you all know if you're doing linear television today, if you wanna run against a football game or a basketball game, you have to buy that content separately. So what it means whenever you look at linear television and the things that you have to take off of the table, and you look at streaming media like OTT, and you take Netflix and Prime Video and others off the table, you're left with similar amounts of media. So the reality is in both buckets, you have to take some of it off, some of it off the table, but you're left with, as a percentage, very similar amounts of media in both categories. So yes, it's Netflix, but it's a lot of other things as well. So to that end, what are some of the ways that we actually can look at OTT. Sling, Netflix, HBO has apps, ESPN has apps, the Roku, your connected televisions like LG, Vizio, Samsung, your Fire Sticks, 
These are all ways that people and families are consuming media in the OTT environment. So talking about consuming that media though, what I wanna do is spend a bit of time talking about the three different buckets that they can fit into. Linear TV, I think we've talked about at length enough, but digital TV and OTT really are in the, for the most part, same bucket as linear video. And the reason they're in the same bucket is because they do kind of the same thing. They reach very broad audiences. It's long form content, content that is a football game versus a highlight reel. It's a movie versus a trailer. And they are very limited on their targeting. Frankly, you usually are limited to targeting at maybe a ge geography and probably adults within digital TV. And that's going to typically be the end of your targeting. The reason for that is those devices, the Samsung TV, the Roku, the Fire Stick, they don't actually cookie people. So we can't marry their online behavior with their viewing behavior, not in any consistent way that's not probabilistic in nature, and then be able to serve uh, targeted content against that because we can't tell precisely that it's the same person. In the third bucket, you have what I call online video. And that's your short form. So this, instead of the football game is the highlight reel. Instead of the movie, it's the trailer. Instead of the nightly news, it's the newsreel on CNN or Fox. And they're almost always less than 10 minutes. It's very short form type content. These are almost always served on a small device, a mobile phone or a laptop or a tablet to the tune of 80% of the time whereas digital TV is gonna be served on the big screen usually more than 90% of the time. And it's for that reason that these two things, because of targeting, because of the way people consume the media, because of the ability to report out on it, they really should be separate buckets. And you as dealers and us as advertisers should be offering solutions that put them into separate buckets so that you know what you're getting for your money. They really have different opportunities. In online video, I could target people who are interested in trucks in the North Houston area. I don't have that luxury within digital TV. So because of that reason and the ones I've already laid out, they really should be separate, I think. Okay. So one last topic I wanted to touch on before we get real practical here is the kind of inventory that you're buying. And so if you're used to buying linear television in particular, what you find is that there is uh, this need to focus on TRPs, which is rating points, targeted rating points, how many people are watching a program, because no matter whether or not someone's watching that program, it's a push environment. That show, that program is getting pushed, whether there's somebody on the other side of that screen or not. So you have to focus on programs that have high viewership. In the OTT space, it's a pull environment, which means that someone has requested the media come to them. And so what that means is that every time something serves, whether it be MASH or Andy Griffith or Regneck tractor pulling, there's somebody on the other side of that screen watching it, right? So that changes the need for this definition of premium. Because in the linear space, premium is defined by the number of eyeballs you can probably reach. Well, we know how many eyeballs we can reach in OTT because we know there's somebody asking for the content. So all of a sudden, serving against MASH at 2 a.m. on a Thursday night is probably more valuable than serving Thursday night at 7 p.m. against This Is Us or NCIS because I can pay less for MASH, guaranteeing there's a real person on the other side of that screen that I'm going to pay for NCIS. So one other thing that we see here pretty consistently is that Many, many, many dealers have been excluded from the television space for a very long time. They tend to be excluded from that space because there's very high minimums to even run media, or because even if they can afford the minimums that are there, they have expensive creative costs associated with reaching the space. And so these two things really mean that probably two thirds to three quarters of dealers aren't even getting into the television space. OTT takes that away. It gives dealers, it gives lots of dealers the opportunity to get in the living room on the big screen in front of new audiences 
in your local market. And that's why it's so powerful and so valuable, particularly as not many dealers have moved over to it yet. So getting practical, who can you buy from? I've convinced you OTT is the best new thing, right? It's the best thing in it since sliced bread. But there really are three different types of, of providers that you can buy from. You've got your local options, which might be the local Fox 13 network, or maybe it's a local agency that you're used to working with, or maybe even it's an iHeartRadio or someone like that. These guys I would call resellers. What they're offering to you is essentially a full package. They're going to service it. They're going to make sure your ads run. They're going to work through an exchange to make sure the media gets bought. And you don't have to do anything. You can just hand them your money. And they're going to take care of it for you. And that sounds great, but there's a lot of added costs doing it that way. So it's not bad. It's just if you don't want to have any participation in the strategy and the execution, this might be your solution. But there's going to be a number of fees associated with it. The reseller fee, the exchange fees, the DSP fees, you're going to have vendor fees. There's a lot of fees there, but what you're getting for those fees is uh, really a turnkey solution. The second bucket for, uh, particularly for large dealerships, is going to be to work through a publisher directly. So a Comcast, a Cox, a Spectrum, a Hulu. Now, these are going to get you really good quality media. And frankly, they're going to offer the best targeting usually of anybody out there because of something called single sign-on. We can talk more about that later if you'd like. But this is going to get you access to really premium quality inventory, very many things that you're going to recognize and places to serve ads that you're going to recognize. The, the downfall there is that it tends to be very expensive compared to both of the other options. It's going to be the most expensive route to take. You're still going to have to have some participation and strategy. And then with some providers, you're going to be limited to whatever their distribution network is, whether we're talking about a Cox who has 48% of a given market or Hulu who only has 35%. If you're only buying from them, you really need to supplement with one of the other two so that you've got complete coverage. And then finally, you've got those who are going to give you just direct access to the exchange. They're not going to provide all the strategy services. So if you're a tinkerer and you want to be highly involved in the process, working with someone like a Premion or a Tegna gives you the ability to get right into the exchange and get that access without a lot of the other fees associated. Now, there are still plenty of fees, but not as many as working through, say, a local option or a reseller. And so just to keep this you know, fairly short, I wanted to only touch on the topic. There's so much that we could say about it. We could spend hours and hours talking about it. But what I wanted to do is give you sort of a primer and whet your appetite and hopefully inspire you to learn more or to reach out. So again, thank you guys for having me. I hope this was educational and beneficial. So uh, Josh, it certainly was educational for me. And uh, I liked your pacing because so much of this is we hear somebody say, uh, are you considering OTT? And we'll go, yeah, you know, whatever. And we'll, we'll shake our hands or, or someone will say to you, you're doing OTT, aren't you? And you're like, uh, I, mm -hmm. I am. I, I don't know. <laughs> and you're too embarrassed right. to ask. So out of curiosity, so we know if we look back at, at what Synchro is core features of what you're known for, uh, you know, websites, mm -hmm. digital training, you've done historically a lot of work with the OEMs and, and uh, programs with digital advertising. What do you all offer right. with respect to services for OTT? Uh, is, is this mm -hmm. something that, as you describe it, that you all are getting into, you've been into? Uh, can we learn a little bit more about what Synchro does? Absolutely. So, I'm thankful that you asked. Just in case you asked, I actually put a couple of slides together to just show you what we did. Uh, and I appreciate the opportunity to explain to you what we do. So let me actually go into that. All right, so I just gave you guys the three different people that you, or three different types of provider that you could buy from. I would say that Synchro fits into a fourth bucket where we really cross, we straddle a couple of the other ones that we were just talking about. So, for those of you who aren't aware, we've been in advertising for quite a long time. We've got some really sophisticated ad tech, different conversation for a different day, right? But part of the things that we own is our own IEB certified, Amazon certified video ad server. We also own our own DSP. So very much like those that give you access to the exchange, we do that. 
but we also give you the full agency type service that you get out of that first bucket of the reseller without the reseller fees. We own our own tech. We don't have to mark that tech up. We cut out all the middleman. And then one of the things that we've recently added is actually video creative. So I mentioned a minute ago that many of the, the dealers who have wanted to be in TV have been excluded. There's four, five, seven, eight, ten thousand dollars is what it costs to have someone come to your showroom floor and shoot video. We now offer uh, for less than a few hundred bucks creative that can take dealers who really haven't had that at their fingertips and put them again in the living room. So these aren't your super slick, uh, you know, $5,000 videos, but they are taking your assets, your offer, your inventory, and putting it in front of customers. Beyond that, as I said a minute ago, we brought this stuff in house. So the typical cost associated with doing this kind of work is you have to create the asset, you have to serve it through a DSP, you have to pay somebody an ad server fee to get your ad on the publisher site, you have to pay for a reseller to bundle all that stuff up and all the agency services, and then you have to pay for the vendor. Because we brought all of that in-house, we don't charge any of those fees. There's no cost for the DSP. There's no cost for the ad serving. There's no reseller fee. There's only our very small margin. And if you need an asset, the cost of the asset creation. But if you have your own, we can take that and get it serving for you within a matter of a few days. So really our benefit that we're bringing to our dealer partners is that we cut a lot of the middleman out. We cut a lot of the costs out. And because we have our own tech, we control every knob, every dial, every lever, so that you get the best quality inventory and we exclude a lot of the garbage that tends to go into a typical OTT buy. Things like Minesweeper or things like Clutch Cargo who just serve impression after impression after impression between every five minute video. That kind of stuff, because we control the DSP, we can exclude it. And then the final bucket would be that if you're part of an association, for associations, we still cut out the middleman. We can dealerize every single creative on behalf of each dealer in the association. And then we can manage your AOR so that we serve against really the area that you are responsible, AOR, PMA, whatever it's called by each OEM, we can help you manage that and contribution. So in the association environment, the LMAs, the HDAAs, the FDAFs, we can actually help you and manage all the things that are critically important to you as an association. So that's very briefly what we at Synchro do. Um, hopefully I didn't get too in depth on what we're doing, but I wanted at least to have the opportunity to show you guys what we were doing and why it might be interesting for you guys to give us a call. Yeah, and if you do want to reach out, uh, Josh has got his contact information that'll be uh, available to you as well. Uh, thank you, Josh. Great job. Obviously, uh, that was something that uh, I appreciated learning. We already have a couple of questions that have popped up in the queue. If Becky or Chelsea want to respond. Yes. So the first question is, many dealers still use lot services to take pictures and will do videos. How are your videos different? What the lot services that a dealership is already paying for? Yeah, I assume it's probably the creative that we build in-house uh, that, that they're probably asking about. So the first thing I would say is, if you've already got your own video, we're happy to take that video in and put it into the wide world of the OTT environment for you. If you're looking to get creative and you've got lot services or you've got something else on your own and you've got some assets that you want to use, we can take those assets and we build a creative for you. So we take a lot of static imagery, we take your logo, we take your pricing, we put all of that stuff into the creative and then push it out live for you. So it really is a supplement if you're doing something like that, or it potentially is not needed for you if you've got your own video and you want to just give it to us so that we can get it into the environment out there for you. Excellent. Uh, Becky or Chelsea, looks like they're- So the next question was, what do you think are the best time periods to advertise on digital TV? So that's a really good question, and I attempted to speak to it briefly within our, our conversation that I gave you a few minutes ago, but there aren't any is the short answer. Or if there are any, it might be those times where you don't have to pay as much to guarantee the placement. So 
So day parting is a big part of linear television today, and it should be because of the way uh, audiences work in linear television. But in the OTT environment, because you can guarantee there's somebody on the other side of that screen, and that's what I was getting at with serving at 2 a.m. against MASH, that would typically be a very bad buy or a late fringe buy in the linear environment. You're going to push that content regardless of whether or not someone's there. Um, in the OTT space, because of the pull nature of it, there's always somebody there. So the time of day really doesn't matter because in the world of COVID and the world of binge watching and, and other services, it really comes down to, is there somebody there on the other side of the screen? And in the OTT space, we can guarantee that there is, unlike with linear where day parting is a critical part of the process of deciding when and where to serve your advertising. So the, the next question that I've got is, um, Someone texted me a few minutes ago and said, why all the different acronyms? Why don't they just call it digital TV and why does it matter? Um, <clears throat> so technically they all do mean something slightly different. Uh, the reality is that most people don't understand those differences. And so they've become pretty interchangeably used, David. It's uh, whether you're talking about OTT, CTV, Smart TV, FEP, they all have slight nuance to what they mean, but at the end of the day, because people don't understand those nuances, they use them all interchangeably. As an example, CTV is a subset, technically, of OTT, because it's a connected television. So now I'm referring to just the Samsung TV or the Vizio or the LG and excluding by calling it CTV, the Roku, the Fire Stick, uh, Sling services, depending on how you're framing it up. So the end of the day, I wish everybody would call it digital TV. I will continue to call it digital TV because I think it's a nice all-encompassing term that sort of differentiates it from linear television, but that's why there's so many acronyms. Gotcha. Okay. Becky? I have another question. So, uh, okay. so it's like watching TV via a DVR. The viewer has to watch the commercial no matter what time they are watching it. What's to stop them from fast-forwarding past the commercial? So most OTT video, so this is a fairly technical question. Most OTT is served through what's called a stitched um, impression. So what that means is when someone's sitting down to watch Seinfeld, when Seinfeld downloads to their device, they're, let's say they're watching it on their tablet or they're watching it on their big television in the middle of the living room, the download includes the ad itself. So because it's a part of the program that's downloaded, it's not really a skippable type of ad. So in OTT, unlike online video, there's really not a whole lot of skippable ads in the space whatsoever. It's very much like our linear television and that the ad is embedded as a part of the, the content that's streaming. And so most of those ads get served. The viewability is usually above 90%. 99% is really what you should expect out of most vendors. Okay, excellent job and thank you very much, Josh.